You're listening to WCAT Radio, your home for authentic Catholic programming. Hi, everybody. This is Dr. Cynthia Tulin Wilson on my show, Author to Author. And I'm here with David Hyduck, who has written a very interesting book called Healing the Culture. How are you tonight, David? I'm doing well. Thank you. Good to be with you. I'm glad you are. You know, healing the culture is something that we all need to think about. So yes, that's indeed. that's a great topic. Um, would you like to open us with prayer? Sure. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And dear Lord, we ask you to be with us and to send your Holy Spirit to inspire us and to give us the words that we need in order to give glory to you and to extend your kingdom. We ask for the intercession of Our Lady as we pray. Hail Mary, full of grace, the grace Lord is with Lord thee. Is with thee. Blessed, blessed art thou blessed among women, and blessed is, blessed the, fruit is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Jesus. Holy Mary, Holy Mary Mother, of God, Mother of God, pray for us, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of death. death. Amen. 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 Paul II, pray for us. Pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Okay. Well, this is... Uh, this is an exciting topic. I'm uh, kind of curious as to how um, how you decided uh, to take on such a huge uh, issue and um, what really led you to decide to write the book. Yeah, well, the, the full title of the book is Healing the Culture and the Family, According to John Paul II. Mm-hmm. And uh, I had been very much moved in my own life by the teaching and work of St. John Paul II, mm-hmm. uh, especially in the areas of respect for life and of marriage, mm-hmm. sexuality, and the family. And in fact, um, his teachings on these issues were very, very important to my wife and my faith journey. Um, and so we tried to live it, obviously. So like, mm-hmm. but I was, a, I was studying theology and I was teaching theology and working in pastoral ministry. And so John Paul II's teachings in these areas became something that I felt a sort of personal mission to share because mm-hmm. it had such a profound impact on me personally and on our, our marriage and on our family. Mm-hmm. So, um, so that's how things really got started because eventually I, um, you know, obviously went through a lot of different writings and teachings of John Paul II, mm-hmm. became very fascinated with his work. And in particular, I was always struck by the astuteness of his, of his cultural analysis, like mm-hmm. what it is that he saw as the underlying philosophical issues that had led to the current crisis of truth and the crisis in the culture and in the family. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and he does this in, in a number of his works, you know, from Evangelium Vitae uh, mm-hmm. to, uh, to Familiaris Consortio and to the letter uh, to families um, and even Veritati Splendor and other writings. So his, his writings tend to always bring up what are the philosophical issues and where did they come from? Mm-hmm. Right. So I think that I've always been attracted to that and to his understanding of that, his analysis of that, mm-hmm. and uh, and always found it to be profoundly true. What he what he sees to be a, a lens through which if you were to look at the culture and the things affecting the culture and, and the things affecting the family, mm-hmm. you began to, to piece it all together. Why it is just contemporary men and women seem to think and act as they do almost Mm -hmm. without thinking about it, right? Part of who they are, part Mm -hmm. of the very air they breathe and what they've, so to speak, caught, you know, Mm -hmm. through growing up in the, in the culture. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so this book was really an attempt. It was, it's actually the, uh, a reformulation of my doctoral dissertation in which I tried to basically focus on that, focus on, what it is that John Paul II saw and mm-hmm. how it is he attempted to respond to it. And, mm-hmm. uh, and, and, in, and in a nutshell, that's what the healing the culture and the family according to John Paul II is. It's, a, it's it, using the language of, of heresy as a spiritual disease, right? Mm-hmm. 
and using the language of his anthropology as a remedy is, <laughs> is showing what his diagnosis is. What are the things that have, you might want to say, infected contemporary ways of thinking and being? Mm -hmm. uh, what are those er erroneous ideas and where do they come from? And then how was he specifically trying to respond to that through his teaching on the human person and through his teachings on on marriage and sexuality. Mm -hmm. So so that's why I think that he, through what he was trying to do, was trying to heal the culture and the family. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what I've just merely done is tried to identify what it was he was diagnosing and how he was trying to respond or rem remediate it. Mm -hmm. It makes a lot of sense because, you know, the way we think of uh, marriage and the family today in the culture, not within the church, but in the culture, um, can only lead to the destruction, you know, really of, uh, of many lives. Well, literally of many lives and through abortion or birth control, but uh, ruining lives, um, you know, it's just it's had a tremendous impact on the culture. When we stopped thinking of one man and one woman for life right. and, you know, started thinking of same sex or, you know, not bothering to marry or having serial marriages. So it's it's really very destructive, um, not only really not only of the culture, but of the people. Right. Well, and, and this is the this is the thing. It, it's it's something critical and crucial. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and, and but what but what John Paul II was saying, you've got to get at the roots of it. You you, you can't just sort of treat um, the you know. There's it's one thing to like apply a tourniquet or like to try yeah. to put bandages on wounds. It's it's mm -hmm. another thing to try to go to the source of the ailment. And I think that that much of what John Paul II was trying to do was respond to the source of the ailment, mm -hmm. which which interestingly enough he saw as as a series of philosophical errors, wrong ways of looking at the human person and creation more generally, mm -hmm. that really we have filtered down to us symbolism. That, that have made its way back in our have imbued the culture and uh, in a way that people just accept these things as true or as the way things are without ever questioning them. You know, so yeah. in, in, in the book, what I focus on is the fact that in, in John Paul II's letter to families, mm -hmm. he talks about a new manichaeism that, mm -hmm. is, that is being faced by the human family. But his discussion of this new Manichaeism, which Manichaeism, as many of your listeners may know, is, is an ancient uh, Gnostic dualist heresy associated with um, Mani from Babylonia uh, that was, you know, in and around the 200s, made its way into Christian um, mm -hmm. circles. And, uh, and so had, had a a very interesting viewpoint of the world that there was actually two co-eternal principles and all good God called the father of lights that dwelled in the realm of light and an evil prince of darkness that dwelled in the realm of darkness. And that basically all things spiritual were of the father of lights and all things material associated with the prince of darkness, such that you had a radically dualistic view of the world. Mm -hmm. Um, and the whole way in which the world was seen by the Manichees was that the light elements were entrapped in matter and needed to be set free. Mm -hmm. So one of the ways, of course, that the light was perpetuated in matter was through reproduction, which happened through marriage and sex. And so there was a radically negative view of the human body, of all things bodily and man of marriage, of sexuality. Procreation was seen as the greatest evil because uh, man himself 
contain the greatest amount of light substance. And so you are perpetually trapping large amounts of light substance if you were to reproduce. Interestingly, mm-hmm. the Manichaean elect didn't seem to mind too much about the Manichaean auditors, which were like a lower class of helpers in the Manichaeans, having like really uh, licentious sexual encounters um, mm-hmm. as long as they didn't reproduce. That was the main thing, you know? And in that way, it's sort of interesting how much it bears a striking resemblance to today where the child is like a burden to be avoided at all costs and like the greatest obstacle to personal fulfillment. Um, mm-hmm. But somehow licentious uh, sexual liaisons is uh, are just fine, you know? Like um, mm-hmm. So it, it, in that way, there's a sort of connection to... Augustine called the Manichees, of course, Augustine was a Manichaean auditor for a time mm-hmm. until he became the greatest apologist against the Manichees. And uh, he said that, that the Manichees were the consummate, uh, were, were the ones like the consummate contraceptors, you know, like that, mm-hmm. that was it, some, a big mm-hmm. thing for them. Um, mm-hmm. So anyhow, so the Manichaeism itself, it's like, well, we don't have Manichaeans today, you know, like we don't have these these monks who barely move, who like deny themselves through these extreme ascetical practices and try to release light elements in foods by ingesting a ritual meal. We don't see anything like that. So what is John Paul II talking about, right? What he's fundamentally talking about is this idea that in today's world, the body and the spirit are put into radical opposition. Mm -hmm. And coming from Descartes, the person is really identified with his or her consciousness, right? His or her spirit, his or her mind or thought, not with the body. The body is consigned to the material cosmos as just mere matter or pure extension. Mm-hmm. That, that as the material cosmos can be used and manipulated in any way, the matter can be used and manipulated in any way that, that man sees fit, by imposing Mm -hmm. his own, you might want to say, ends on matter, the body is included in that and thus becomes an object of manipulations, you see, an Mm -hmm. object in which you can, that you can manipulate for your own ends. and choose. And so this is a very important point of connection between what John Paul II sees in Descartes' philosophy and Mm -hmm. this new Manichaeism. Um, And then, of course, like, if, if the physical world is mere matter, there's also a denial of the idea that God has created the world um, with intrinsic ends, right? Mm-hmm. So, so there's also, d- d- typical of Descartes and rationalism, a rejection of, of uh, the Aristotelian Thomistic model or scholastic model mm-hmm. um, that would say there are things such as formal and final cause. Formal and final causes are completely eliminated. There is no end for which things are created. There is no form that informs a being's characteristic activity that is ordered towards an end. All that's a concern for Descartes are efficient and material causes. He would say we couldn't know God's purposes in creating things, and that therefore it's for us to construct orders instead of recognizing some kind of created order and Mm -hmm. and try to manipulate matter as best we can to make everybody's lives lives better you know Mm -hmm. like so so why this is important is that if everything is mere matter and things don't have formal or final causes then there is no truth towards which things are directed Mm -hmm. and and if you see today that's where we're at i mean like you know, you think about, you, you mentioned some issues with regards to varying ideas about marriage or about sexual, um, you know, relations and acts. Effectively, that's people imposing their own ends on something like sex. Instead of saying sex has an end for which it was created by God, and mm-hmm. I need to recognize and I can know what that essence of sex is, what the nature of sex is, and can conform my behavior to that mm-hmm. end now i'm the one who decides what the end is you see mm-hmm. and so when once you have that you've got you know big problems and that's i think a lot of the problems we face now of course human nature has itself been deconstructed 
And <laughs> this leads to some of the points you were bringing up, even about what is masculinity? What is femininity? What are our bodies about? You know, if our bodies aren't really us and are just matter that we can manipulate and I'm really my consciousness or what I think, well, then you could see where things like even transgenderism, where I think I'm a woman trapped in a man's body, but that must be who I really am because that's how I feel and what I think Mm -hmm. leads to people saying, but my body is just mere matter. So I'm going to change it to, to, do what I think it should do or to be what I think it should be because I have now disconnected it from the overall structure of my nature as a person, as a body soul composite. Right. So, Mm -hmm. so there are things like that. I mean, you could also see like in the abortion issue, um, you mentioned the abortion issue. You can also see in that these ideas at work because the idea that, for example, that, that, that sexuality is ordered toward the end of procreation is itself like thrown away. Right. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, when people try to justify abortion, they'll say things, well, it's not really a life or it's not really a person. And what's their rationale? The rationale is that it doesn't have consciousness yet. Mm -hmm. It's just a blob of tissue, just matter, right? Just biological material. Like you'll hear these kinds of things. And yet it's due to this radical opposition between spirit and matter, this identification of the person with his consciousness or mind or spirit versus his body mm-hmm. that, that is at the philosophical root of that, you see. Mm-hmm. So you know, these are just some examples, but it gives you an idea yeah. of what mm-hmm. winds up happening. So what winds up happening in the moral life are that there's this tendency towards relativism, I mean, I impose my own ends. I decide what things are for, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and also utilitarianism. The, the, the best thing that we could try to do is to, you know, say the, the greatest amount of pleasure for the greatest amount of people, especially if I can't know what things are really for. Well, at least we can go after efficiency. And unfortunately, you know, phil- uh, philosophically, utilitarianism holds the maxim that the end justifies the means. And that in itself becomes very problematic because uh, one of the things John Paul II thought about our neo-Manichaean culture that resulted from these errors of Descartes was that, that sex becomes an area for manipulation and people are used the way things are used. Mm-hmm. You can see that in the culture too. Like mm-hmm. you can see that obviously in the realm of sexuality where people are used for, for sexual pleasure. But you can see that also in the realm of like biotech, where, Mm -hmm. you know, basically uh, the experimentation on human embryos or in vitro fertilization or all these sorts of things really turn the person into an object of technology. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of consequences, you could say, of these viewpoints. And St. John Paul II drew all these out. And so that's what I try to do in the book is first trace what he saw. Mm-hmm. Then go to Descartes' work mm-hmm. and show where it comes from in Descartes. Mm-hmm. Then go to Manichaeism and show how it is analogously related to Manichaeism, both ancient and medieval. Um, and, and then show how John Paul II's very anthropology, particularly in the theology of the body, is structured to respond to those very errors. Mm-hmm. So. That's a lot. <laughs> that really is a lot. Um, and you know, when you look, if you look around our culture at this point in time, you know, I think we see the the hopefully the end results. I hope this isn't going to go on permanently before humans start to see what's wrong and fix it. Yeah, well, again, what, what's it going to take to fix it? That's the mm-hmm. real question. Yeah. It's, going yeah. to be, it's going to have to start by a, in what John Paul II calls an integral vision of man, mm-hmm. right? Um, it's going to have to start through a, a fundamental understanding that we are our bodies, that we are a body-soul composite, mm-hmm. that that my body is me. I'm not merely a body in the sense of just matter, right? Mm-hmm. 
Right. But I am my body. And so what I do with my body, I do. Mm -hmm. What is done to my body is done to me. Mm -hmm. And when I give my body, I give myself. And when I give my body totally, like in sexual union, I give myself totally. Mm -hmm. You know, reclaiming um, the body and understanding it subjectively and personally is, I think, a really important place where we need to get. Um, And yet, I think we can talk to people about that and you can get somewhere there. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. Of course, also too, I think essential is, is going back to just fundamentally demonstrating that there, there is a creator Mm -hmm. that the creator created with an end in mind Mm -hmm. that, that all being participates, all created being participates by way of imitation uh, in supreme being that that effectively everything receives its essence from God, mm-hmm. um, and so that's key because if you can get people saying, okay, well God creates, but God doesn't create for no reason. Mm-hmm. Um, so like you know, if you go to God, it's like, why did you make that? He's not going to go. Psh! You know, like I just. <laughs> <laughs> that's priceless. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Gee, I don't know. What do you think? I, so, like, you're not going to get that. So, so if God creates for a reason, mm-hmm. then and then God has written the reason for His creation right into the nature of things. Yeah, there's a created order, and mm-hmm. then so that's where natural law comes in, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then also that's that's also how divine revelation, both in Scripture and sacred tradition build upon what we can know about the essences of things and help us to further know God's purposes in creation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and so it it kind of, but that's very important. So like it's, you know, in a world that, that is, or a culture that is growingly atheistic, uh, it's hard to convince people that there's any meaning to anything other than the meaning they think there is. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think that ultimately people are getting there. Like, if you have a conversation with somebody and you, and you say to them, well, you don't believe in God. And they'll say, no, I don't believe in God. I say, well, then you mustn't think that any of this has a meaning. And they'll, they'll probably argue with you. No, my life has meaning. Mm-hmm. I say, well, what, what kind of meaning does it have? Well, it, I, I do things that, that make me feel happy and fulfilled. And so I can give my life meaning. I say, oh, okay, wait. I didn't say, can you do things that you know, make you happy for a certain amount of time? I didn't ask a question of whether or not you can, you know, make your own life somewhat meaningful by doing certain things. Mm-hmm. But you have to understand that whatever you're calling meaningful is something you made up as being meaningful for you. Mm-hmm. But, but it, it isn't meaningful in itself. It's not like intrinsically meaningful. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's only whatever you assign meaning to. Now, you have to get to a place where you, you feel the existential weight of that. You know, you, you have to get to a place where you recognize, well, either there is a God and everything is imbued with meaning, or there is no God and there is no meaning. And this is just some kind of cosmic accident. Um, and there's nothing, there's no meaning for anything. So I think that like, you can have that conversation with people because I think there's something deep within us that knows that our life has meaning. We, we talk about this all the time. We talk about people's dignity. Well, what does that mean if mm-hmm. there is no God and there is no meaning? You know, like we, we talk about social justice these days, mm-hmm. right? Well, what does that mean if there's not a right and wrong? And that means something objectively right and wrong. And how do we have that if there's no God and no meaning? Like, you know, you can really get at people because they tend to speak in contradictory ways, right? Mm-hmm. So they have the way they learn from the culture, this neo manichaean way, this way that is really riddled with the errors of Descartes on down. And then they've got something in their heart they just know to be the case. Like there is a right and wrong and I ought to act a certain way or I have a fundamental dignity that I should be treated in a certain way. You know, like there's, mm-hmm. that's built in and, uh, and so I think you can have a conversation with people about that, you know. 
Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's um it's interesting how we can live and have such contradictory thoughts and think that we're we're right. <laughs> you know, it's like it's you think that one you know, I mean, I think a lot of people do come to an awareness of the contradictions, sometimes the help of other people, but I bet a lot don't. They just wander through life never seeing the contradiction in their thinking. No, I, I think that I think that there's a, a truth to that. And, and and let's face it, like on some level, maybe they don't want to see it because mm-hmm. maybe they're somewhat content with the way things are. It's like, you know, don't yeah. <laughs> it's like, like don't don't bother me with the facts. You know, like there's just like a, <laughs> there's a certain element where it's like, oh, I don't want to know. You know, like yeah. I, I don't want to know because that means I might have to change. change. Mm-hmm. You know, and I think that that's that's a big truth that I come in contact with is that people are we would rather kind of go through the motions than to have to change because on some level status quo is the devil they know mm-hmm. having to change is the one that they don't and of course that's not the devil that's God mm-hmm. but like you get my point yeah. you know like that's so no like, I know so like in this way. Um, the fear of what having to change or accept this truth would mean for my life. Mm -hmm. That's why people avoid it. I mean, I talk to my students about this very fact all the time. And, and I basically say, Hey, like, be honest about it. Like you say, you can't, you come to me and you say, Dr. Heideck, I can't live the way the church tells me to live. You know, Jesus is teaching. Those are too hard. I can't do that. I said, but you will drive your body beyond belief to accomplish athletic goals. Mm -hmm. You'll exercise, dare I say, fasting and mortification. You'll like beat your own body through exercise and, and weight training. Because you think that if you do that, it's going to accomplish a certain goal for you athletically, for your team, whatever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Said so, So don't tell me that you can't. Likewise, I know that you'll spend an enormous amount of time, like, you know, studying to improve your SATs 100 points. You'll take Mm -hmm. classes. You'll work hard. You'll study. You think that you can improve that. So you'll do it. Mm -hmm. The question here is not whether or not, with God's grace, you can live the way Jesus calls you to live. The question is whether or not it's a value for you. Because the athletics are a value. The yeah. academics to get into the college you want, that's a value. Right now, living like Jesus asked you to live isn't a value, and that's why you're saying I can't. Not mm-hmm. because you really can't, or you really can't do the things that are required in order to do so. It's that mm-hmm. you don't really want to, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, and I think that that that's a lot of people are there, you know, and I, and I'm not necessarily judging them for that, but I would suggest to them that they should be honest with themselves about what's really going on, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. at least at least be honest and say, yeah, okay, you got me. I'm not ready for that yet. You know, mm-hmm. I'm kind of happy living my life the way that it is. And they'll say, okay, well, thanks for your honesty, but mm-hmm. at least don't try to fool yourself into thinking mm-hmm. that somehow you can't. I mean, from the standpoint of, of what God expects of us, none of us can. That's why we need grace. But like, but to say to say that I can't with grace is is almost like saying God can't do this in me. yeah yeah you know like and I would not think there's anything that God can't do so mm-hmm. <laughs> so it's that's an interesting point that you're making about someone who can really do very difficult things but doesn't want to do something that is presented to him, um, you know, concerning God. But it's like, I also wonder, because this culture, any culture, I think, um, the environment you live in, um, it, I think it contaminates us. And one of the reasons, I, I was just watching the TV the other night, I, I never, you know, I'm 72 years old, and I am absolutely stunned that Roe v. Wade was overturned. Mm -hmm. I figured this is not going to ever happen. I completely agree. I mean, I was in tears. It was like, finally. But um, there was a young woman on television crying, and she's like, 
you know, people are talking about the, the baby's body, but it's my body. And it's like, you know, if the way she was acting, I don't think she was faking it. I don't think she was lying. She really believed that a baby wasn't a separate individual, you know, or at that point, not separate, but not an, uh, an individual person. It was just some cells in her body that needed to be gotten rid of. And it was like, how, how can a society contaminate people to such an extent? And I think that's such a strong force on people. You know? Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. And I think that yeah. there's um, this is part of what John Paul II, I think, recognized. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. In, in talking about this new Manichaeism or the neo-Manichaean mm-hmm. culture in which we live, mm-hmm. the language he uses is very interesting because he talks about the human family um, having to undergo the experience of a new Manichaeism. Mm-hmm. So one of the things that comes across clearly is that he believes that this is something that human beings become infected with. Mm-hmm. See, It's a way of thinking, a way of seeing the world, ourselves, sexuality, that, mm-hmm. that, that we become infected with. Mm-hmm. And being that Manichaeism is a heresy, you know, mm-hmm. like what is a heresy but a spiritual disease that infects yeah. the body of Christ? And on some level, mm-hmm. um, because the the history of western civilization is very much um aligned with christendom you know mm-hmm. like in christian history that a, a heresy is going to affect all of western culture on some level mm-hmm. you know so i think that john paul ii recognized that mm-hmm. and and yet recognized that this is something that people just kind of you might want to say inhale that the that the new manichaeism as a spiritual disease is airborne and people just kind of suck mm-hmm. it in. Mm-hmm. You know, like in, and yet there needs to be a remedy and there needs to be an antidote. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and so I think that like, you know, he, he, his teachings are very much an attempt to provide such an antidote, mm-hmm. but, mm-hmm. but that's why he didn't just focus like on the, in the theology of the body. One of the hopes of the book for me mm-hmm. is that people are going to see that the, the theology of the body is way bigger than they ever thought it was. Oh yeah. You know? And, mm-hmm. and, so oftentimes we look at it as, oh, it really teaches nice things about, you know, what the dignity of the human person or about being male and female or about marriage and sex and all that's true. Mm-hmm. Um, but in a far broader way, what he's mm-hmm. trying to do is reorient our way of thinking and seeing so that we can appreciate mm-hmm. who we are, mm-hmm. um, the, the place of the body in our personal structure. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it, effectively the theology of the body is a reflection on creation to understand what mm-hmm. creation is and what God had in mind when he creates right to see those intrinsic purposes in nature mm-hmm. to see the irreducibility of the human person to the mm-hmm. to the natural world mm-hmm. and and also to see um, human sexuality and marriage as ordered to ends to mm-hmm. see um, masculinity and femininity not as social constructs or <laughs> merely related to how I feel or what I think in my consciousness, but rather, rather, rather a, a particular incarnation of, of the human being created in the image and likeness of God. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, this is one of the things that like, you know, becomes difficult in our culture because like when, when there's these terms like whatever cisgender and the like that people mm-hmm. use, um, well, from the standpoint of, of Catholicism, we don't distinguish between what your body is mm-hmm. and what your gender is. If you're mm-hmm. physically male, you're a, you're a man. Yeah. If you're physically yeah. female, you're a woman. And, mm-hmm. and it's because you are your whole person. And, mm-hmm. and the body is the principle of indiv- individuation in the person, according to Thomistic philosophy. Mm-hmm. And so it's the body that identifies what sex what you are. are. Yeah. You know, like, so the idea of like having all these different terms, this is one of the things that I get concerned about when, when such terms are used in Catholic schools is, you know, and become in part of the attempt to try to create greater inclusion and diversity, that they're actually utilizing language that fundamentally contradicts the way the church understands these things. It's the mm-hmm. language of the world and of the culture. Mm-hmm. So, uh, to, to just as a little bit of a side, I have uh, another book that I'm 
that I'm researching for now. Mm -hmm. And it kind of is like this, like you might want to say uh, part two, because mm -hmm. um, in the theology of the body, John Paul II in one of the audiences talks about um, what he calls the masters of suspicion. They're Freud, Nietzsche, and Marx. And actually the masters of suspicion is a term that was used by Paul Ricoeur, or the philosopher Paul Ricoeur. Mm -hmm. um, now, what John Paul II does is identify Freud, Nietzsche, and Marx each with one of the three um, threefold concupiscence. Mm -hmm. So like, so the three lusts, if you will. So mm -hmm. Freud is the lust of the flesh, um, Nietzsche is the pride of life, and Marx is the lust of the eyes. Mm -hmm. But that's all he does. He just says that and he kind of like wanders on, <laughs> you know, like and I've always found because these are the sorts of topics in John Paul II, I find like really exhilarating. I'm like, wow, like that's a bomb. Mm -hmm. um, so the the next book I'm working on is called Not of the Father, which is mm -hmm. the, the part of the, the verse from First John chapter two about the threefold lust. And the, the subtitle is the threefold, the, the masters of, of suspicion and the threefold lust. So basically what I plan to do is show how Freud, Nietzsche, and Marx, which by the way, all three of those thinkers are inheritors, you could say, of the Cartesian tradition. So it's like, so the philosophers that come after Descartes in that overall tradition from the Cartesian turn, you could say, that become focused on all these different uh, things really are just carrying on these same mm -hmm. uh, four errors of Descartes that John Paul identifies in his letter to families. Mm -hmm. So um, so what's really interesting to me about that is, okay, so what is it in Freud that has to do with the, the, the lust of the flesh? What is it in, in Marx that has to do with the lust of the eyes? What is it in Nietzsche that has to do with the pride of life? And how is it that all three of those people who were radically anti-Christian and atheistic mm -hmm. have now form the basis of so much that we do in contemporary culture? I mean, much of critical theory, for example, flows from the Frankfurt School, which uh, was a place where basically cultural Marxism was born. And there was a wedding between Freud and Marx that has led to much of the critical theory that we see now routinely taught on college campuses and mm -hmm. informing a lot of these diversity um, programs that we see today. So um, obviously social justice is something that I think is something true and wonderful that we mm -hmm. should be fighting for. But what we shouldn't be doing is adopting an anti-Christian, atheistic, actually contradictory position of how to approach those mm -hmm. things which you mm -hmm. find from Freud, Nietzsche, and Marx, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the, the sexual revolution, the attacks on the family, um, the way in which that's tied into a radical feminism that is also associated with the, the, the pro-abortion movement, which also has a connection with the LGBTQ movement and all these sorts of things, they all ultimately flow from this threefold concupiscence that is associated with Freud, Nietzsche, and Marx. So one of the things that I'm trying to do is, okay, well, this is what John Paul II saw in Descartes. This is how he's trying to respond to it. But mm -hmm. let's, go, let's go a little further down the road and see mm -hmm. what flows from that Cartesian tradition and these other thinkers that have, in a very real way, um, formed the basis of a lot of how we think today. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's really odd when you think of how much uh, influence Descartes had. Yeah. You know, it's, yeah, yeah it's, um, wow, you know, that's, uh, that's a lot when you think of the influence he's had on the Western world. Well, you could almost argue that Western philosophy after Descartes was really about dealing with Descartes. <laughs> You know, like, oh, that's discouraging. <laughs> <laughs> we lost our tradition. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but if you think about yeah. even what happened, like, you know, mm -hmm. what, what flowed after Descartes and eventually was, I would say, on some level, entrenched in the work of Immanuel Kant. Mm -hmm. right? And then, you know, how out of Kant really flows Hegel, which is mm -hmm. going to form 
the the philosophical basis of Marxism and mm-hmm. his uh, dialectical um, philosophy, you know, mm-hmm. dialectical materialism, mm-hmm. and and ultimately the existentialists that wind up leading to Nietzsche and the very denial of the human nature altogether, right? And and then fundamentally with Freud, uh, you've got effectively this notion of 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 sexual repression that is the basis of all of man's psychological ills and problems. Mm -hmm. So so when you've got those combos and you look at how those are impacting today, um, it it really does flow out from Descartes' tradition through Kant. So Mm -hmm. It's all very sad. (laughs) It really is. Once you know it, once you know it, now we can talk about it, see? It's it would matter if we couldn't identify it. Then, like, we mm-hmm. couldn't, like, get yeah. under the, what is it these people said and why is it problematic and, mm-hmm. and what mm-hmm. are the presuppositions they, are, they have mm-hmm. and why are those problematic? And so I think that, to me, that's hopeful. It, it can be. But when I think of uh, this country in particular, um, I think that it's the things that we're talking about are so entrenched. Mm. Whether it's abortion, I mean, just even watching the news and learning about monkeypox and, you know, the doctors standing there saying, well, you know, this is this is usually carried by men who have sex with other men, multiple partners. And it's like, that's why they get it. I mean, that's there's there's no there's no sense of right and wrong. It's just so entrenched. It's all at at. The best for us, I could say, would be sometimes it's neutral as opposed to being stated as something good. So the society is so confused, it really sees evil as good. The best we can hope for is at least some people look at it neutrally, so they're not saying it's good. It's it's really weird. Yeah, I, and I think that there's a certain unwillingness, again, because of the way in which humans have developed this mm-hmm. idea of themselves being their consciousness. Mm-hmm. Um, wonderful, a wonderful, wonderful book. I think absolutely essential reading is it's written by a Protestant theologian. His name is Carl Truman. And mm-hmm. he wrote a wonderful book called the rise and triumph of the modern self. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and he recognized, I think something that maybe some others before him, like Charles Taylor recognized, is that we really do live in the age of the psychological self, where the person is identified with their psychology. Mm -hmm. And and, and when when you identify the person with their psychology, what winds up happening is a whole new definition of what harm is. Mm -hmm. Because now, if you say something against somebody's, like, actions, but they identify themselves with those actions... Mm-hmm. Um, then, and that's who they are, then to say something against those actions is to say something against them personally. And now you're mm-hmm. causing them harm, and that's discriminatory. Oh, so, like, so, like, that's, that's yeah. part, in part one of the reasons why nobody is willing to say anything about right and wrong or make any judgments and try to stay as neutral as they can. Mm-hmm. Because they're absolutely terrified of being called a d- discriminatory or a bigot Mm-hmm. For saying something, you know, like that that would be against what somebody would choose to how somebody would choose to act, but they see themselves as being. So, like a prime example of this, of course, would be with regards to um, same sex attraction. Mm-hmm. You know, I have an attraction for whatever reason. The person has an attraction um, mm-hmm. to uh, somebody of the same sex, mm-hmm. and and yet that attraction now i act out by like you know engaging in in same-sex acts to speak out as at same-sex acts as same-sex acts being immoral Mm -hmm. is to somehow deny who i am Mm -hmm. in my identity or 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 to say that you know on some level is to make a a statement against me Mm -hmm. and so so thus you can't say same-sex acts are bad you can't mm-hmm. make a value judgment even to stop spreading a disease, you know, um, mm-hmm. because to say that would be almost to make a, a hateful statement, according to contemporary culture, against a whole group of people, you see. So, so now, of course, 
the question of how we got to the place where we think that way about ourselves and thus the way we understand, even like can help us understand our cancel culture and why people, you know, get canceled because of saying things that are viewed as, as bigoted when, you know, before we used to make distinctions between even what somebody felt or their inclinations and their actions. Mm -hmm. And, you know, now that, that sort of barrier there is gone. Gone. Right. So, um, so yeah, so it just Carl Truman's book is key, I think, for trying Mm -hmm. to understand how we got here. Um, Mm -hmm. And, and yet it's really because of Descartes ultimately, you know, like, so, like, so, uh, Christopher, Christopher West uh, had a great line. Um, you probably know Christopher West, oh, yeah. <laughs> a uh, commentator on the theology of the body, and had done a lot of work in this regard. Uh, he said that, like, we've seen in our day and age, uh, Descartes' cogito come to its uh, full, you know, you might want to say, to its fullness. It's, it's now no longer, I think, therefore I am. It's, I think, therefore I am what I think I am. Wow, yeah. You know, I think that's really yeah. insightful. Um, it is. It is. Kind of narrows it down. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, boy. I don't know. You have to wonder where it's all going to end. Well, you know, God, Jesus is Lord. Mm-hmm. He's Absolutely. The of, he's the king of the jungle, right? <laughs> um, so, ultimately... It, it could get rough, but we know how it all ends. Oh, yeah. Well, <laughs> yes. At, at the end, the end. But I just mean in our culture, you know. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. You yeah. like to always say that it can't get worse, but it seems like it, it can. can. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm sure it can get much worse than it is, you know, so, which is frightening. But I do see, you know, um, I see just this little piece of hope. Because of Roe v. Wade being turned over, yeah. you know that that gives me just the littlest bit of hope, and you know that's important. But you know where I think that hope comes from? I think that if you look at your younger generations, why mm-hmm. it is that they um, have, let's say, warmed up to the pro-life position, even mm-hmm. though if you were to do a study. You would probably mm-hmm. see that many, 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 you know, I, I don't know like what the study would mm-hmm. show, but I would say a pretty strong majority of those who are young people who hold pro-life views would also mm-hmm. be very in favor of same-sex marriage and all that sort of stuff. So like mm-hmm. it, it, it's one of the things that I've noticed is that people's acceptance of same-sex marriage has grown while they've taking on a little bit more of a pro-life viewpoint. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I think that it goes back to this idea of how we understand harm. So mm. this is like actually caused a good result in the way in which we look at the unborn, right? Mm-hmm, we're starting mm-hmm. to recognize that, well, no, abortion does harm the unborn. So, yeah. like, and we yeah. don't have to do any harm. And mm-hmm. so it's like, well, that just doesn't seem right. And so mm-hmm. their position changes to, you know, maybe these extreme circumstances in which a woman might need one as opposed to just a general view that a woman should be able to have one whenever she wants right Mm -hmm. so you've seen that growth but Mm -hmm. at the same time their ideas about you know love equals love and people should be able Mm -hmm. to love who they want and and who are we to judge you know because this is who Mm -hmm. they are and and if it's who they are then you know that that we're only do we don't want to do them harm either you see and so a more mm-hmm. skewed understanding of harm in a way. Yeah. Like obviously they're talking about psychological harm. We, we would never, mm-hmm. we would always want to speak out against violence against yeah, of course. West yeah. West, West attraction, all that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. But, but yeah. now to even be able to say that to say same sex marriage is not marriage or same sex acts are immoral and sinful for those things to be considered harmful to say Mm-hmm. that's kind of where we've come today. Yeah. Yeah. I think though that there is, there is some hope. I mean, you know, to me, I think what changed many people's uh, young people's opinions on abortion was seeing, um, you know, the, 
the videos, I don't know how they do them, but the videos where you can see a child being aborted, you can see the child trying to get away, you know, almost trying to defend itself and being, you know, so it's like, it's very clear, you know, as you're saying that there's harm there and a person can see that if they, if they are open to the truth. Yeah. And let's just say, I mean, let's mm-hmm. give credit where credit is due, you know, mm-hmm. pro-life, pro-life organizations for, you know, the last 50 years, That's right. Yeah. Have been like working hard at mm-hmm. educational um, programs to mm-hmm. help people to understand that the mm-hmm. baby is a person mm-hmm. and that abortion is harmful mm-hmm. and, and violent. Yes. And, so, and yet at the same time as extending a helpful outward face up mm-hmm. hand to people who are in trouble. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so like, I think that that's also an interesting thing. Now, what do you see today? The, the, it seems like the, the center of attack are pregnancy resource centers now. So now like those people who are vehemently pro abortion, who think that, you know, the overturning of Roe versus Wade is the worst thing that's happened in, in maybe mm-hmm. in history. Um, <laughs> That uh, now, now the target of attack is to go after, you know, crisis pregnancy centers. Uh, They're trying to give women options and uh-huh. to put them somewhere under like government control in a very strict way, basically to stop them from being able to do what they're trying to do, which is help. Uh-huh. You know, like, so if yeah. there's an irony there, you know, do no harm, but let's go after the places that are actually trying to help people. You know, like it just doesn't make any sense. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I think this, again, all connects because Mm -hmm. it really flows from a fundamental misunderstanding Mm -hmm. of the human person, Mm -hmm. of of what we were created for, of, of, you know, effectively what the meaning of life is. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, the fact that there is a creator who has created each and every one of us for a reason. Um, and by the way, that's great news. If, yeah. <laughs> if God, God's been thinking of me from all eternity, mm-hmm. you know, and, and I always like to tell my students that like, if you're ever having a bad day, just remember God's thought of you from all eternity. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> that's good. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. So I think, um, I think you've got, uh, I don't know if I'd say that's going to be a bestseller because I think a lot of people would not be able to grasp it, (laughs) but I think, but I think that in the, um, in many academic communities that that is going to have an impact. That's a book that uh, a lot of thought went into. Thank you. I really appreciate that. I I appreciate that endorsement. I sure hope so. I hope that not only it helps people understand what's going on in the culture Mm -hmm. and how that impacts the family. But obviously, I hope that it really makes a good contribution to John Paul II's studies, because mm-hmm. I think that it really helps to show that what John Paul II was trying to do more broadly mm-hmm. was uh, was actually something macro, you know, <laughs> like there was. Well, like, sure, and, sure. Uh, and so uh, and his anthropology in particular was was an attempt to to correct some of these uh, missteps mm-hmm. and. Um, and so, you know, God willing, people will see that and, mm-hmm. uh, and, and relook at his work mm-hmm. and, uh, and see how important it is for responding to the culture. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> well, thank you, Sam. Oh. This, is, this is great. Yeah, I agree that that was a very enjoyable uh, interview. And uh, for me, anyway, it was very enjoyable. And I, I think that we don't often think about the philosophical background of some of the things that are happening in our world to do today yes. and the influence it's had. So it's, it's important. Even the book is important even to just make people aware of that. Yeah. You know? and I'm hoping, I'm hoping that that will make them aware of that. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. Yeah. I think it will. So good work. Thank you. Thank you. Well, yes. give me a lot of hope. I'm, I'm it's nice to, to have people feel that it was, it's an important thing that I did here. So mm-hmm. oh, I think it God is. be praised. Mm-hmm. And you're still young. You've got plenty <laughs> more to write. <laughs> well, we'll see. So. I'm, I tell you, it, it's tough. You know, I have a, I, I, 
didn't say much about myself, but like I, we have uh, a large family, my wife and I, um, mm-hmm. which is lovely and beautiful, but busy. And mm-hmm. of course I, I do a lot of other work. So the time yeah. to write is, uh, is not as, as much as I'd like it to be. Mm-hmm. And so getting through, still trying to get through Freud for this next one. I haven't even gotten to oh. in March yet. So. <laughs> <laughs> so. Yeah, that you, sounds you know, exhausting. <laughs> yeah, well, yes. Well, that's true, too, because you can only read so much of this stuff at a time before yeah, it's just like, yeah, yeah, you yeah. just have to put it down. <laughs> I agree. I agree. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, so I hope uh, I have you. I hope you have a lot of success with the book, because I think that it will influence people. Thank you. And that's very important. Well, interviews like this help. So I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about it. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay. Um, would you like to close us in prayer? Sure. Absolutely. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And dear Lord, creator of all things and creator of the human person in your image and likeness, male and female, we thank you for the gift of life. We thank you for the opportunity to share with one another the truth that will set us free and fill our lives with happiness and peace. We ask you to be with us and our families, and we ask you to help us bring the good news of life and love to the world and to respond with love and intelligence to the errors of our time. We ask this as we pray, glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, Spirit. as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, be world without without end. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Yes, you too. Take care. Bye-bye. God bless. Bye-bye. Hello, God's beloved. I'm Annabelle Mosley, author, professor of theology, and host of Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. I invite you to listen in and find inspiration along this sacred journey we're traveling together to make our lives a masterpiece and, with God's grace, become saints. Join me, Annabelle Mosley, for Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. God bless you. Remember, you're never alone. God is always with you. Thank you for listening to a production of WCAT Radio. Please join us in our mission of evangelization. And don't forget, love lifts up where knowledge takes flight.